around to another short tip video for this, the OM1. And this time I'm going to talk about the settings I use for wildlife photography. Here in Wales, as a wildlife photographer, the thing I photograph probably 99% of the time is small birds. Uh, so I'm going to start by going through the general settings I use for that. So as you can see, I shoot in manual mode. Uh, pretty much universally for wildlife photography but what I use with manual mode and why I use manual mode is that I have auto ISO enabled. For photographing birds I use a minimum shutter speed when I want to capture action of one two and a half thousandth of a second. This is pretty much perfect for most birds in terms of getting sharp details in the eye and on their body but getting blurry wingtips. If I want to freeze the motion even better for very specific birds, so very small birds uh, with jet, very jittery movements, that sort of thing, I will up this to 1 hundredth or 1 four thousandth of a second. Um, but 2,500 hundredth of a second is the, the perfect point on the OM1 for me. This value does change depending on the megapixel count of your camera. Uh, higher megapixel cameras are more prone to motion blur, so typically need a higher shutter speed. But on the OM1, this is the value for me. As I think I mentioned in a different video sometime in the past, I pretty much always shoot this camera wide open on the 300 millimeter lens. So I'm at F4 all the time. So that's why it's in manual mode. I just want it in F4. I want the shortest depth of field possible. And it's a micro four thirds camera, so it's already got quite deep depth of field. I don't need to stop it down for birds that are closer up, further away. That's that's the biggest it can go. So I just have it set to that. As you can see, I have auto ISO enabled and I have the range on this configured to go up to 25,600 as a maximum. In dark conditions, this camera doesn't perform great. But if you have good light, then you can shoot at 25,600. And if it's well exposed, maybe even slightly overexposed, you're going to get still a decent image that can be noise reduced later and actually come out with a pretty decent shot. So I do leave that as an option. It's better to expose correctly on this camera rather than to underexpose. When you underexpose, you get a lot of color shifting in the shadows. One thing I do often do on the IM1 is to expose to the right, which is a concept quite common in bird photography in particular, which is to add a stop or maybe less of exposure. So you're overexposing the image. The OM1 is particularly good at dealing with this. When they said that it had better dynamic range on this camera, they weren't lying, but it's not in the shadows. It doesn't recover from shadows better. What it does do is recover from the highlights better. It's got very good protection in the highlights. So you can very safely overexpose your photographs on this camera. So when doing bird photography, I would probably recommend always rolling with a plus one value on exposure compensation. In terms of picture style, I shoot raw on this camera. I don't shoot JPEGs at all, but I do still set a picture style and I have it set to three, which is the natural picture profile. And I just do this because when you do import the photo into Lightroom, it will adapt the raw file using its camera matching profile and it will set it to something that roughly correlates to the OM1's JPEG profile for natural. I leave white balance set to auto most of the time. I don't find that I have many problems with that in this camera. There is a color shift at high ISO in the shadows, but that's not due to white balance. That's actually a, a thing with the sensor and it's a magenta shift. So auto white balance doesn't really affect that. I just leave that set to the default. So as I've said in a previous video, I use the silent sequential drive mode most of the time at 20 FPS. Yes, it has a viewfinder blackout, but it allows the widest range of ISOs and I find the speed, the right compromise between capturing the motion or the action that's going on and not running out of buffer space for extended sequences. Not unsurprisingly, I use the bird object detection mode. I have the object detection mode set to a button. I have it set to one of the front buttons by the lens, uh, which allows you to push and hold it and change the object you're photographing using the rear control dial. 
I quite like that setup. I pair this usually with the large AF grid option. This is generally more reliable, I find, than using the all option. The all option has a tendency to focus on things on the edge of the frame. This happens in all of the focus modes. The own one has a fairly weird behavior when it comes to detected objects and things actually outside of that object, but within the focus region. So for example, with a bird that's set in the grass, it will sometimes focus on the grass in front of the bird or the waves in front of the bird on the water. It's a little bit weird. So to reduce that, I tend to restrict my focus region to large for sort of birds in flight, things like that. They will normally go into that region. If it's a bird amongst reeds or things like that, I'll drop the size down, maybe even to small. Very rarely use the single uh, AF point with object detection on. I usually take it off if I'm going to use that. Um, but as you can see, I've got a few custom modes set up as well. These are not strictly that useful. I would say that this one, the C3 mode that I have set up, which is a wide rectangle, is somewhat useful when you're trying to capture birds flying over the tops of crops, for example. So like swallows flying over the tops of uh, some crops in a field. That mode is quite useful. Uh, this C2 mode with the extremely wide, only one block high rectangle I use for birds on the water sometimes. For a similar reason, I find that it prevents the system from focusing on the waves in front of the bird. And for that mode, you just place the very long rectangle effectively on the water horizon against the background, and it will pick up the bird that's on that. It, it works okay. In terms of the autofocus system I use, I have said in a previous video, I think on the 1.3 firmware, that I was trying CAF with tracking again. I have again given up on that. I just find it unreliable. The tracking makes it less reliable than using continuous AF. So now I'm back to continuous AF again. As you can see, I've enabled always on manual focus on the focus ring. I prefer this to using the focus clutch because the focus clutch is very noisy when it comes to birds. Uh, so I don't use that and I've disabled it. So that covers most of the settings that are available just on the default controls. Uh, and they're now currently just blinking away on the screen. Let's look instead at the ones in the menu and some of the settings I would recommend changing. I set the color space to Adobe RGB personally. Uh, that's just because I believe it to be better if you do eventually want to print your photos, but I wouldn't necessarily say that's a hard requirement. And it can make it more difficult when viewing your photos on a computer. You do need to export them correctly to sRGB or you get some very weird colors. When it comes to ISO and noise reduction, I have the upper limit set to 25,600. That's already very much on the edge of usable. I wouldn't go higher than that on this camera. Um, I've seen people before say that they never shoot over something like ISO 1000. Uh, for wildlife photography, that's impossible on this camera. If you want to capture motion, you need to be at a high shutter speed like 1 2500th of a second, and you're going to be pushing the ISO because of that. The noise processing and noise reduction stuff at the bottom of this screen uh, don't pertain to very fast shutter speeds, so uh, you can ignore those. As for metering in this camera, I just leave it set to the default. For drive mode, I customize some of my sequential shooting settings, uh, but as I said, I shoot in silent sequential. I've got another video about the different settings in here, uh, which I'll try to link up here somewhere, um, and I'll cover those in more detail in that one because there's more to add to that and it would make this video quite long. When it comes to the image stabilizer in the IM1, I have it set to auto at the moment, but I would say this is a very problematic setting. Um, I should probably experiment more with changing this. I find that when you are moving your camera onto a subject and you start half pressing the shutter, which engages the image stabilization, it falsely detects which axis you're currently moving in and it doesn't fully stabilize it. This isn't necessarily an issue when it comes to still shooting, but it is an issue if you're trying to do video, uh, particularly through a long lens. 
And the only real way to uh, fix this in a video is to toggle the image stabilization off and on using the lens switch. That's a bit weird. I would probably recommend setting this permanently to one of the other settings instead. I do have this set to FPS priority because we just want to maintain better shooting speed. Uh, and I have lens IS priority turned on as well because the 300 millimeter also has an image stabilizer in it. Next up is AF modes. So when it comes to autofocus, as I said already, I use CAF with MF enabled on the focus ring at all times. Uh, I would also then recommend going down to release priority and for continuous AF, you want release priority on. It will mean that it will not bother trying to get perfect focus every time, especially with a bird moving towards the camera or something like that. There's no point. It won't actually allow you to take a photo if you leave that disabled. I have the eye detection frame turned on for subject detection, but this is a little bit of a confusing setting in that the own one doesn't actually focus just on the eye. You can see this effect when you have uh, the full grid of the AF points it's using, but it tends to focus in reality on a wider area of the head. So that's how it gets tricked by things like leaves or twigs moving in the way. It isn't just a single AF point on the eye, it's a wider grid around that area. So just be aware of that. In terms of continuous autofocus sensitivity, I still don't really understand this setting. From the info about it, depending on the movement of your subject for still photography. So I thought that this would be like sensitivity to a new subject entering the frame or something like that. But I believe it actually does relate to the movement of your subject and not the stickiness of it to a subject, according to this anyway. And in my testing and usage, if I have it set to anything less than plus two, it just doesn't track bird movement very well. I don't know if that's correct or if it's just me reading things differently. I find it very bizarre without that. I don't use the AF limiter. I found that very problematic. It causes the camera to scan very bizarrely sometimes. Something I would recommend enabling is the AF scanner. I don't believe this is enabled by default. I find the scanning for subjects on this camera to be very poor, even with this enabled. It doesn't rack focus back through the entire range of the lens in order to find a subject. If something is very out of focus, it really struggles to detect that subject to start focusing. But it is a bit better if you turn that on. Lastly, in the MF section of the AF settings, I turn off the MF clutch. I don't like it as a feature. I don't like it on any lens, on any camera manufacturer. That's my personal feelings on it. Uh, so you don't have to follow that, obviously, but I don't like it. Well, that's a rough summary of the settings that I use for most of my wildlife photography. That covers my default mode that I use most of the time. I hope that's been of some use or some interest to you. If you do anything differently, or if there's anything that you'd recommend that I do differently, please do stick it in the comments. I'd be really interested to read that. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time.